Hey guys, welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today I'm going to try and tackle a topic that seems to be causing a great deal of confusion amongst viewers, and this can be seen in the comment section. The topic is GPU bottlenecks, and I really want to discuss how they impact Ryzen's gaming performance. There is a huge mix of different results regarding Ryzen's gaming performance, and a big part of that has to do with GPU bottlenecks. Right now I am testing the Ryzen 7 1800X and 1700X processors in over a dozen games at 1080p and 1440p, and I'll also be testing with SMT enabled and disabled. Before I get to that though, let's rewind a bit. Throughout the creation of my Ryzen review, I constantly confirm results with other YouTubers. Brian over at Tech City, for example, was a big help, and so too was Kevin from Tech Showdown. We spent many late nights on a three-way Skype chat trying to work out what exactly was going on. Interestingly, we all had different motherboards, though we were using the latest BIOS revisions, and yet we were all seeing the same average 1080p gaming performance, despite all agreeing that the productivity performance was incredible. Now that the reviews are live, I've spent countless hours sifting through data trying to work out exactly what's going on. Unfortunately, very few media outlets seem to provide useful gaming data, in my opinion, apart from the guys that I worked closely with, such as Brian and Kevin. I was also very impressed with the testing done by Gamers Nexus. Gamers Nexus has since confirmed that they are 100% behind their results, which is great as their results are in line with my own. Naturally, there is a difference in the actual frame rates reported as we use different hardware and tested different sections of each game. However, the margins themselves are much the same. We both found that Ryzen was a good bit slower than the 7700K and 6900K processors in Watch Dogs 2. We also found similar Battlefield 1 performance which saw Ryzen competitive in both tests. That said, the Intel processors raced ahead for the average results in my review, likely due to the fact that I used a Titan XP and they used a GTX 1080, and probably we tested different sections of the game. So, as I said, I'm currently in the process of testing a huge amount of games with the Ryzen 7 1800X and 1700X processors against the usual suspects. I now have the Gigabyte X370 Gaming 5 on hand with the latest BIOS, and I've also strapped on a nice big all-in-one liquid cooler for good measure. I have found some interesting results, but for the most part they do just confirm what I found in my day one testing. Before I release that video on Monday, I wanted to try and address the issue of GPU bottlenecks by explaining when and where you are seeing them and why. Admittedly, I'm not the best at explaining this stuff and I haven't really ever tried to do so in the past, so this video is kind of a bit different from the norm, so bear with me as I try to explain what's going on. Firstly, why is avoiding a GPU bottleneck so important for testing and understanding CPU performance? You could test at the 4K resolution like some have and show that the Ryzen CPUs can indeed match the high-end Skylake and KB Lake models when using the GTX 1080 or even the Titan XP. It's true the 1080X, for example, can match the 7700K at 4K in the latest games using most high-end GPUs. So does that mean the 1800X is as fast or possibly even faster than the 7700K? We know this isn't true because we have tested at 1080p with the 7700K and it was quite a bit faster in most cases. Now you might say, Steve, I don't care about 1080p gaming. I have an ultra wide 1440p display, so I only care about how Ryzen performs here. Now that's fine, albeit you are sticking your head in the sand and that can come back to bite you down the track. Before I explain why, let me just touch on why I tested at 1080p and why the 4K results, at least on their own, are completely useless. If you do test at 1080p, technically you don't need to show 4K results, whereas if you test at 4K, you very much need to show 1080p performance. Here's a hypothetical example. Let's say the Titan XP is capable of rendering a minimum of 40fps in Battlefield 1 at 4K. Now, if we benchmark half a dozen CPUs, which includes some Core i3, i5, i7, and even Ryzen models, all of which can allow the Titan XP to deliver its optimal 4K performance, does that mean they're equal in terms of gaming performance? It certainly appears so when looking exclusively at 4K. However, it really just means they're all capable of keeping the frame rate at above 40 FPS at all times. By lowering the resolution and or quality settings, which reduces GPU load, we now start to show the CPU as the weakest link. You can do this by testing extremely low resolution, such as 720p with low quality settings, and that's perfectly fine, though for me you're going a bit too far the other way. I've found that at 1080p using high or ultra high type quality settings using a Pascal Titan X is a realistic configuration for measuring CPU gaming performance. So, other than showing that there may actually be a real difference between certain CPUs in games, why else should you ensure that your results aren't being shaped by a GPU bottleneck? 
Or why is it a bad idea to stick your head in the sand by saying you only care about how they compare at ultra wide or 4K resolutions? Well, for the longest time, myself and other respected tech reviewers claim that all gamers need is a Core i5 processor as you reach a point of diminishing returns with the Core i7 when gaming. This was true about a year ago, and of course there really wasn't much evidence that suggested otherwise. Of course, we often noted that things will no doubt change in the future, we just didn't know how far into the future. Now a year later, things have changed. Games are now more demanding, though I feel the biggest change has been made to GPUs themselves. This time last year, the GTX 980 and Fury graphics cards were considered real weapons. Yes, there were faster GPUs like the Maxwell Titan X or Fury X, but you still couldn't say they were anything less than high-end. Today though, they can be considered as mid-range, with GPUs such as the Titan XP and soon-to-be-released GTX 1080 Ti delivering over twice as much performance in many cases. If we compare the Core i5-7600K and Core i7-7700K in CPU demanding games using the GTX 980 at 1080p, the 8-threaded i7 processor really isn't much faster. Given the margins, I would say get the Core i5, the Core i7 simply isn't worth the extra investment. I recently compared the Pentium G4560 Core i3-7350K along with the i5-7600K and i7-6700K using the GeForce GTX 1050 Ti, GTX 1060, and GTX 1080. If we look at a game such as Hitman, we see that the i5 and i7 processors are on par when testing with the GTX 1060, which is equivalent to the GTX 1080 in terms of performance. Looking at those results, the Core i7 is clearly a bad investment. However, if we test with the more powerful GTX 1080, the Core i7 processor is now delivering over 20% more performance, and that's huge. Increasing the resolution to 1440p, we see that when testing with the GTX 1060, the dual-core Pentium processor delivers the same performance as the i7-6700K. The 6700K is obviously a much more powerful CPU, but the GPU bottleneck simply hides the fact. That said, using a more powerful GPU in the GTX 1080, we see that the 6700K is now 43% faster than the G4560. However, at 1440p we now find the 6700K is just 6% faster than the 7600K, whereas it was as much as 23% faster at 1080p. I found similar margins in games such as Mafia 3, Overwatch, Total War Warhammer, and many others. If you want to watch that video and see the results in more detail, I'll add the link in the video description. Keeping those results in mind, the Titan XP and soon-to-be-released GTX 1080 Ti are much faster than the GTX 1080 again. So the rise in gaming performance that you saw in my review and other high-quality reviews from outlets who tested correctly, such as Gamers Nexus and Tom's Hardware, we can assume a few things. Firstly, if games in the future aren't able to better utilise the Ryzen processors than they are presently, that is to say optimization doesn't occur, then the misleading 4K results become an even bigger issue. In a few years' time, when the GTX 1080 Ti or AMD's upcoming Vega GPUs go from high-end to mid-range contenders, how will Ryzen look in regards to the current Skylake and KB Lake processors? Presumably the 4K performance would start to look like what we're seeing at 1080p. The other side of that of course being, if games are able to better utilise Ryzen, which is of course my hope, then we will start to see the 8-core 16-thread AMD processors laying waste to Intel's 4-core 8-threaded Core i7, KB Lake and Skylake CPUs. The obvious problem being we just don't know how this is going to play out. I remember fanboys giving me a hard time back in 2011 when I said the FX8150 just doesn't deliver, especially in games. The argument at the time was that games only used 1-2 to two cores, and by the time they were using 4 cores or more, the FX series would prevail. Well, no need to dredge that up all over again, we know how it played out. That said, I have much more hope for Ryzen, and I honestly do believe there is more performance to be seen yet. I said the opposite for the FX series, so that's something. Okay, well that's everything I wanted to cover on the subject for now. I hope this helps those of you who were confused by the varying results, and now have a better understanding of where and why a GPU bottleneck is occurring, and more importantly, why it should be avoided when showing CPU performance. As always, if you guys have any questions, please drop them below and I will do my best to address them as quickly as possible. I'm your host, Steve. Catch you again soon.